Okay. Last two minutes. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you for coming to, to the talk. Uh, here to talk about validity rollups. Thank you, John Light, for uh, setting this, setting up the context for for this talk. Um, so I want to talk about validity rollups in the context of uh, specifically looking at how we can utilize Taproot uh, and uh, build the contracts that secure the bridge and the state transition that was talked about before. So there's a lot to talk about, uh, you know, with validity rollups. There's just in scope. There's so much. Trying to fit this in 40, 45 minutes uh, and standing between you and lunch. So I'll try to uh, keep this uh, brief. Uh, but let's start with a high level intuition here. Uh, something that we're already familiar with, uh, with sidechains. Uh, and we'll build on that just to get kind of build out our understanding of validity rollups and what it offers. So with sidechains, uh, you know, we're familiar with going from Bitcoin, the base layer, uh, and doing some kind of deposit, uh, whether that's in some kind of federated multi-sig model uh, or other models that John covered as well in his talk. Uh, or just putting this in the hands of some kind of centralized custodian. Uh, but we deposit this and some uh, IOU or some, some you know, SBTC, call it sidechain Bitcoin, gets minted uh, on this separate execution environment. It could be a separate blockchain. And, uh, and yeah, you transact uh, in this uh, custom execution environment off-chain. Uh, that might be you know, uh, something that looks more like liquid, where it's uh, you know, similar to Bitcoin, uh, with a few additional opcodes, or that could be uh, something totally different, uh, a Turing complete execution environment. Uh, but these state transitions happen, so you transact uh, and you make trust assumptions around uh, you know, those transactions as well. So that uh, could get secured through various different mechanisms. Uh, with sidechains today, that's you know, maybe you trust a federated multi sig, you trust maybe uh, some kind of uh, you know, merge mining process, but those state transitions are secured through. Uh, some kind of trust model uh, that you have, uh, usually some trust assumption that you have to make outside of uh, you know, Bitcoin consensus protocol. Uh, and at some point, you want to withdraw you know, your, 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 your money back, uh, and you withdraw that back into Bitcoin. Um, so this is the, the high level intuition here is, you know, we have this model of side chains, we're familiar with it, um, but how do we enable the deposit and withdrawal process to not rely on a, a third party or something outside of the Bitcoin consensus protocol. Can we secure those, you know, that bridge with transactions that are happening uh, on Bitcoin? And also the state transition. When I transact on this off-chain, you know, execution environment, those transactions, uh, can they be secured through just trusting the Bitcoin consensus protocol? Uh, and so that is the, the goal of uh, validity rollups and, and why this would be uh, you know, a significant improvement to sidechain models that we have today. Uh, and to, to formalize that a little bit, uh, you know, we, we look at this set of assumptions here on the L1, and with just those sets of assumptions, we wanna get towards those two guarantees. So you know, the assumptions being that L1 uh, blockchain prevents double spending. Uh, that really consists of a bunch of sub-assumptions here about you know, uh, SHA-256 is a hash function about, uh, you know, uh, the elliptic curve that we use and the assumptions that goes into it. But it's a, a trust assumption we make today when we transact SATs uh, on Bitcoin. Uh, that, you know, L1 blockchain prevents double spending. L1 blockchain is also censorship resistant, uh, is another assumption that goes into this. Uh, and, you know, those are already assumptions that we're familiar with and that we make. And, uh, you know, users can access any previous full block in the L1 blockchain is another assumption. Uh, and this in particular we'll see is, uh, you know, important when we talk about unilateral withdrawals. Uh, and, uh, and this is, again, you know, an assumption that, you know, we're familiar with, we're okay with. And the fourth assumption here, uh, and, and, and this is something that, uh, you know, we need to work towards, uh, is that L1 blockchain, in, in our case Bitcoin, is sufficiently advanced to support the implementation of an L, you know, the L1 roll-up contracts, which we'll talk about in this talk. Uh, and, and what that really comes down to is that the L1 blockchain is able to verify uh, a validity proof. Uh, and you know, there are other assumptions as well, but that's one of the core assumptions. Um, we'll see that uh, you know, having some kind of covenant functionality as well is gonna be an assumption here. Uh, and that kind of goes into this fourth assumption of 
sufficiently advanced enough to support the L1 roll up contracts. But so, with, with those sets of assumptions, um, we arrive at these two guarantees, and, and this is kind of the, the, the guarantees that uh, we hope to get with just those assumptions with a roll up construction. Uh, and so, the guarantee here is that when a user has funds on the L2, on this off chain custom execution environment, uh, you know, those funds can be transferred, withdrawn back, or otherwise change ownership if and only if the user authorizes that to happen, right? And so it, it can't be done with any, any kind of third party uh, if and only if uh, it is authorized by the user, this can happen. Uh, and uh, the second guarantee here is that the user can unilaterally withdraw all of their available funds in L2 back to their L1 uh, account. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the, the guarantee working with. So this is the construction that, that we're approaching this. Uh, and so why is this important? Just kind of before we really dig into uh, you know the design, um, we have a lot of benefits here around scalability. Uh, you know, validity rollups offers compression in the form of a bunch of transactions that can happen off chain. Uh, you know, gets compressed into a much smaller footprint on chain. Uh, and this is really important for things like onboarding more non-custodial users to Lightning. We know that you know there are certain limitations of just using Bitcoin block space uh, when we're talking about opening, closing channels, and you know doing submarine swaps and kind of adjusting liquidity. And so there are real limitations around the number of users today that we can onboard uh, onto Lightning in a non-custodial way. And so we hope you know kind of the, the scalability benefits are really relevant there. Um, but also just more efficient, efficient use of block space, which uh, in the long run, uh, with more use cases off chain uh, and more efficient use of block space, we hope you know, generates more transaction fees and more demand of block space in the network. So scalability is a really important part of this. Privacy, a uh, very important part of this. And, and John talked about in his earlier talk, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, Zcash style privacy that, that you can have with kind of custom execution environments. Uh, off-chain that exists that are secured through uh, Bitcoin uh, and also configurable privacy is something that we can get uh, and expressivity uh, is another piece of this which is not only important for more functionality so use of Bitcoin as collateral in a trustless way this is not possible today uh, or you know functionality like recurring payments over the lightning network vaults uh, you know safer self-custody but also for better user experience uh, you know with more expressivity uh, on these off-chain environments, uh, you get a lot better user experience. You can build much better user experience when it comes to uh, you know, custom authorizations, maybe, uh, and wallets that you can build uh, with Bitcoin. So this is the importance. Um, so kind of going right into some of the architecture for a roll-up, this is high-level, uh, kind of one, one view of roll-up. As I mentioned before, there are many different ways on the off-chain kind of L2 that you can build. There are many different models that you can take here. You can have an account-based uh, you know, L2 system. You can have a UTXO-based. Maybe you can have a hybrid account UTXO-based as well. We'll just, in the scope of this talk, kind of just focus on an account-based uh, system. Um, and you know, there's a additional scope here in terms of what kind of proof systems do you use, what kind of uh, you know, uh, VM that you use uh, off-chain, et cetera. Um, for the scope of this talk, we'll look at Starks as one class of proof systems that we think might make sense in the context of uh, you know, Bitcoin and our requirements here. Uh, and we'll look at a, some kind of ZKVM front end uh, for that Stark without going into kind of details on exactly what that you know, design would be. So uh, you know, kind of looking at this high level architecture, you have this alternative blockchain uh, that exists as an L2 uh, where the execution uh, is done uh, and where the execution complexity sits. And you have Bitcoin as the base layer where uh, you, you, know, you inherit security and uh, where you have like, not the execution complexity, but you do cheap verifications of all the complex execution that goes on elsewhere in this roll-up blockchain. So that's kind of the high level picture. Uh, so the roll-up blockchain here is, uh, doing a bunch of transaction, doing a bunch of computation, but turning all of that into uh, you know, 
validity proofs uh, that it's broadcasting down into Bitcoin and that the validators uh, on Bitcoin uh, are verifying uh, that validity proof uh, and securing uh, the, the state transitions that go on in the roll-up blockchain along with securing the bridge uh, for deposits and withdrawals. Um, so that's, that's the high-level view. Uh, we can kind of go more more detail in terms of like exactly what this looks like, you know, centralized sequencers versus decentralized sequencers, what the block producers look like, how the mempool interacts, etc. But I have limited time here, so I'm not going to go into all of those details. For the scope of the talk, let's assume here we have a central block producer uh, model. Uh, and so you have kind of one operator that's sitting in the L2 that is responsible for batching a bunch of L2 transactions. Uh, along with you know deposits and withdrawals and uh, generating uh, executing those transactions generating proof uh, that attests to that computation uh, and uh, broadcasting that to the mempool on Bitcoin uh, and so uh, let's assume you know for for this talk we have a, a central you know one kind of operator or block producer doing this uh, there are models that you know and I think this is active discussion in terms of can there be shared sequencers? Can there be you know kind of multiple sequencers? How do we actually uh, you know, incentivize those sequencers? But that's outside the scope of this talk. So what I want to focus on really here is talking about in the context of Bitcoin, um, how do we think about a roll-up contract, and how do we leverage uh, paid tap uh, or you know uh, to secure. But you know the bridge and the, the state transitions on the roll. Um, so this is this is what we're going to go into deeper in this talk. Uh, and so I propose uh, looking at this as a taproot transaction. So the roll up basically exists as a taproot UTXO, uh, where uh, funds are deposited and locked in that roll up UTXO, uh, and that. Uh, you know, contract manages a couple of things. At the, at the bare bone kind of minimum here, it manages three things. One is uh, how deposits are handled. So we have a tap leaf for deposits, uh, and we'll go into kind of the script and, and, and the witnesses there. Uh, it handles uh, state update transitions uh, as another, uh, you know, tap leaf uh, script here. And uh, there's a uh, you know, contract for handling unilateral, unilateral withdrawal uh, as another uh, you know, script. Uh, and there's one more mechanism that we need this roll of UTXO to handle, which is how do you store state commitments uh, within the UTXO? Uh, and here we use, uh, and, and there are different models to do this even within Taproot, but we use uh, the internal key slot uh, and basically create an unspendable internal key uh, to have the data commitment uh, for uh, state, um, the, the roll-up state that's managed within the UTXO. So I, I mentioned roll-up, uh, so actually, I, yeah, let me skip here. Uh, I mentioned roll-up state commitment. Just want to talk briefly about that kind of before, before going um, into other things. So there is a concept of a roll-up state that this single UTXO has to manage. Uh, and in particular, the most important thing is that there is a you know, state of the L2 uh, blockchain that needs to be uh, you know, committed onto you know, the, the roll-up UTXO. So the L2 state root. Um, so now if, if, if you know, looking at the account-based kind of system for our L2, that might be a uh, Merkle root uh, commitment to the account uh, data of our L2. If we have a UTXO-based, uh, you know, L2 system, you know, that's going to be different uh, based on the UTXO set. But some kind of you know state root commitment is what uh, is saved in this roll-up state. Uh, and then we also have the concept of saving pending deposits, just the way that our uh, roll-up UTXO works. Uh, you know, people make deposits into this UTXO, and those deposits are pending until the L2 state root is updated via a state update transaction, and then those pending deposits are reset uh, after making sure that those deposits actually did make it into uh, you know the new L2 state root uh, that's committed. Um, so that's what the, the 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 state actually looks like. You know, again, kind of minimum form, 
and that's like a 66 byte roll up state. We commit to that state using uh, you know, this construction that we have on the left, um, where uh, we utilize the taproot internal key point as the place we're committing. Um, we you know, ensure that this is an unspendable internal key point, so it's really just reusing this as data store more than uh, a, a, a spendable uh, internal key. And we do this uh, actually via the mechanism suggested in BIP 341. Uh, which is uh, use H uh, as a uh, point with an unknown discrete logarithm. And I think there's a specific H that is even suggested in that bib. We use that H uh, and we formulate the internal key point P as H plus, uh, you know, this uh, commitment on the roll-up state. So hash of the roll-up state turned into an int, um, you know, uh, multiplied by the generator point. And so that gives us a guarantee that P is unspendable because we know H is uh, un, you know, un, unspendable or has an unknown discrete logarithm. So P becomes the internal key. I mean, the, the main point here is that the internal key we're using as a data commitment to the rollup state. Uh, and then we have uh, this script tree root with a couple of different uh, you know, contracts in terms of how you go about doing the deposit, how you do the unilateral withdrawal, and how you do the state update. So, that's the, the kind of high level construction. And then we have a single roll, uh, you know, roll up UTXO. It's a taproot uh, contract that is locking all these funds and manages this control flow. So kind of the minimum requirements we need now is that uh, you know, this, we, need, we need to be able to enforce covenants here. This needs to be, have a recursive covenant structure so that we can propagate the roll up state. Uh, and enforce this control flow on deposits and withdrawals from that roll-up UTXO. Um, right, so like, you know, someone uh, spending the roll-up UTXO, which contains all of the deposited funds, can only spend, you know, to the roll-up UTXO, which should contain all the deposits and funds. They can't run away with all those funds uh, with the, within the defined rules of each of these tap leaf uh, contracts. Um, so enforcing covenants is a really important part of this. Uh, and secondly, the requirement here is that there needs to be some mechanism to verify validity proof. Um, and in particular, that mechanism uh, we need in the uh, state L2 state update contract. Um, and this is because a bunch of execution, a bunch of you know, transactions are execu executed off chain. Um, you know, we don't execute those transactions that are off-chain on, on Bitcoin. We are just given a, uh, a, a proof, a testing to that computation. Uh, but we need some mechanism to know that there's a valid state transition from the old L2 state route to the new L2 state route. We need a mechanism on Bitcoin to be able to verify that validity proof uh, that was broadcasted. So, verify the validity proof and secure the correctness of uh, L2 state transition. And with these two requirements, uh, you know, we can construct uh, a validity rollup on Bitcoin, which is both exciting and daunting because it's, you know, these are big requirements, but also exciting because, you know, it's you know, not, not too far away, perhaps. Um, and so kind of going on this requirement too of, you know, we need a, uh, New, we need some kind of uh, verification primitive available to us. Um, here, what I'm proposing is a, a, in just kind of a, as, as a, a example, a, a tab script opcode uh, that enables verifying start proofs. As I mentioned before, the, the scope of what we're looking at here is uh, you know, start based proof systems. Um, of course, there are a lot of different proof systems, and we can kind of talk about uh, different. Uh, trade-offs there, but uh, for this talk, we're looking at start proofs, and uh, we propose, you know, adding uh, a new opcode that enables verifying a start proof uh, as a tab script opcode, um, and the interface would look something like this. Um, you know, you're given a start proof, uh, a hash of a program, um, and the public inputs in form of an input state and output state. Um, this opcode is able to return true if uh, you know that start proof is 
uh, it, you know, if, if, if it's verified to be true um, for that particular program in those input states, uh, public inputs, uh, and it returns false otherwise. Uh, so this is one construction, uh, and it's also, you know, the way that this is constructed it is, makes certain assumptions about the ZKVM as well, um, being a, a perhaps like a stack-based ZKVM where you have an input state and an output state. Um, but all, all this is, I mean, kind of at a high level, what, what this is doing is, um, if you were to run a program with a particular program hash that is, you know, we call it the program hash here, uh, with a certain input, uh, that, that it would produce that output. Um, and you know, that is the proof that attests to the correctness of that computation. Uh, and if this is true, then you know, we, we can know that that input transitions to that output by running that program, um, with potentially some private inputs there as well. Uh, so that's the interface uh, in terms of you know kind of how we would get a you know, validity proof verification primitive here. Um, we've talked about the role of state commitment, so let's talk about you know kind of some of these transactions how they would look. I mentioned before there's the deposit, there's the state update, and then there's the unilateral withdrawal. Uh, so this is a deposit transaction. It's something that a user makes uh, to the roll up UTXO, uh, which contains you know locks all the funds. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of a general structure of what a deposit transaction could look like here. You have a roll-up UTXO, you uh, add in a, you know, whatever funding UTXOs you want as a user, um, and you create uh, a roll-up UTXO that has you know, the additional deposited amount that, that you want, along with maybe some refund uh, amount to your refund UTXO. So that's the overall structure. Um, and you know, uh, here it takes the the deposit witness takes a, a set of deposit inputs. So we'll, we'll look into kind of what that might look like. Um, as, as I mentioned before, that like deposits are handled uh, via like building up some kind of pending deposits tree uh, within the roll up state. Uh, so we could use like a Merkle Mountain range uh, to basically take in a bunch of deposits. Um, and build up that tree. Um, so the user would provide the you know the latest on the on the latest roll up UTXO that they're spending the the set of Merkle tree uh, roots uh, uh, the the tops of the Merkle mountain range uh, that could be variable size and they provide a, a few other fields here that are fixed size uh, such as the you know the public key they want associated with the deposit so this would correspond to their L1 public key of the depositor. Uh, how much they actually are looking to deposit, uh, you know, so the amount, uh, and then also would provide some data on the current roll-up state uh, and internal key. Uh, and lastly, they would provide the new internal key. Again, the internal key is a data commitment um, that we use. Uh, so provided all of this in the inputs, um, the script kind of high-level pseudocode would look something like this. Uh, it consists of verifying that the Roll up UTXO value field is correct. So basically, the you know the deposited amount plus the old value for the roll up UTXO is equal to the new value of the new the, the UTXO just created. Um, we'd need some form of covenants to actually do that uh, to to you know to check that the deposit uh, value is correct. Um, we also verify that the current roll up state is correct uh, that was provided in the witness. Again, that requires some form of covenant. So this uh, this is to ensure that uh, you know really it's around kind of enforcing the the roll up UTXO is uh, spent to the roll up UTXO that like the 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 funds aren't kind of lost or leak out somewhere uh, and that they're secure. Uh, so we verify the the current roll up state is correct by looking at uh, the uh, the, the the, the output that is spent. Um, here, uh, in this current construction, you may require kind of an additional opcode. So if we were to implement this out in something like elements, uh, there's an opcode available called tweak verify that we could use uh, to be able to verify current rollup state is correct. Um, but that actually could be done in absence of su su such an opcode as well. And you could actually do this uh, 
uh, using uh, the opcode that I mentioned earlier with verifying a start proof. So you can actually do that, tweak verify computation, and just verify the proof uh, of correctness there. Um, you compute the new rollup state, and then you verify that the rollup UTXO script pop key uses an unchained tap script, tap root script tree. Um, and then also the uses the correct rollup state data commitment as the internal key. Um, so this is all again kind of enforcing the covenant where a, you know basically a deposit is made, uh, the value is updated correctly, and then you transition the rollup state uh, correctly to the you know the the next rollup state. Um, so in, in that process as well, uh, in a deposit, the rollup state is changed. Uh, the L2 state root is not changed, but the pending deposit hash and the pending count is incremented by one and the pending deposit hash uh, is changed as well uh, because we have a deposit that came in. Um, so imagine basically that you know, in a given block, there would be a bunch of deposits uh, and a bunch of deposits that are pending um, and those are initiated by users. Uh, now you have a L2 coordinator sequencer that initiates a state update transaction. Um, and so the state update transaction basically, uh, it, so it spends from the latest UTXO that's you know, still pending here in the mempool uh, that contains you know, these pending deposits in, in the state. Um, and uh, the, 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 the sequencer basically um, takes a bunch, you know, these deposits, updates the L2 account tree, also handles a bunch of L2 to L2 transactions. Uh, those go on and, and also handles certain withdrawal requests that are made to the sequencer on L2 um, and generates a, you know, transitions the L2 state from before to the new state uh, by verifying all of those transactions, executing all of those transactions off chain, generating a proof attesting to that uh, and uh, you know, post this L2 state update transaction uh, onto uh, Bitcoin, you know, the Bitcoin mempool. Um, so this spends from the latest rollup UTXO that contains all these pending deposits. Uh, and this spends to a rollup UTXO where uh, you know, the, the value is changed because uh, there's a bunch of withdrawal requests that are uh, handled here. So a bunch of withdrawals are made out from the rollup UTXO. These are withdrawals that were requested uh, on L2 to the sequencer. Um, and the rollup UTXO, the, the rollup state is also changed. So the L2 state root is changed to the new one. Um, and the pending uh, deposits data is reset here. Um, so th this is what goes on in an L2 state update transaction. Um, and the you know, inputs uh, for something like that uh, looks like the following. So you, you present a proof attesting to the state transition computation correctness. Um, you present uh, a new L2 state root, uh, you know, uh, that, that should be updated here uh, in the rollup state. Um, you also, in, in, in this uh, state update, a, a really important part of the witness that's presented here is compressed block data. Um, and this is because uh, we need this data to do the unilateral withdrawal. We need that data to be available on chain so a user can actually kind of combine all of this compressed block data uh, since kind of origin of this role of UTXO and, and have a complete state of L2 uh, and have an idea of kind of what their funds look like as well and prove that, you know, that's, that's the funds they have. Uh, and so why, why say compressed block data here is we don't actually need to put all the transactions with all the signatures onto Bitcoin. Uh, that would be really expensive. Um, we actually just need, you know, we don't need to present signatures at all really here. We just need to present the, uh, if we're looking at it as an account-based structure on L2, then like some kind of state diffs uh, that need to get presented uh, on Bitcoin that basically say like, look, this account, you know, previously had uh, you know this value, etc. Now this account has like this updated value, uh, and at the you know very beginning, maybe for deposits, that block data looks kind of different. It's this account was just initialized, and it has this particular uh, L1 public key associated with it. So, uh, you know, different formats. We can go into that, um, you know, later. 
but different formats for deposits, uh, L2 to L2, you know, state uh, transactions, and then L2 to L1 transactions, but some form of uh, block data that is compressed and presented here as data availability as part of the witness of the state update transaction, uh, one of the fields. Uh, and then there's, you know, in this kind of centralized sequence or coordinator model, uh, some kind of signature from the coordinator as well. Uh, and then in similar data to the deposit, you need current roll-up state uh, and then the, the updated uh, new and uh, the, the current internal key and the new internal key. This is all again to enforce the covenant and make sure that uh, the, the transition of the rollup ETX is correct. So this is what we would expect in the state update script, uh, script inputs. And the kind of the pseudocode for L2 state update script is longer. There are more things to do here, but um, it's, it's a similar set of uh, 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 similar set of operations that need to get carried out. Um, so initially, you know, we verify that the authorized coordinator signed the transaction, so we have that signature in the witness. Um, we verify that the new UTXO value is correct, so what that means is just, you know, the, uh, the UTXO, the old UTXO value minus all the, you know, withdrawal amount values equals uh, the uh, roll up UTXO value. Um, we verified that the current roll-up state is correct uh, before you know, kind of going into enforcing the covenant. Um, and you know, basically, it, it, I can kind of I have limited time here, but it, it consists of a bunch of these verification checks. Um, but ultimately, what we have here, uh, and, and kind of the important part, is uh, step six, where we verify that the L2 state transition is correct. Um, and, and to do that, we need that. Uh, validity proof verifier um, opcode. Uh, so there it's, you know, the proof that is presented, the start proof that is presented, um, we can basically show that the old L2 state root transitions to this new proposed L2 state root um, using the set of block data, you know, compressed block data that's presented um, and, and the proof that's presented. And if we verify that's correct, then we can be sure that uh, you know the state transition program um, is 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 correct. So the state transition program hash would just be notice that it's not passed in as a witness. Um, it could be, but it's you know just a fixed part of uh, the L two state update uh, script. Um, but the, the you know the state transition program basically uh, goes through each uh, transaction that happens, uh, authorizes the signature, updates each of you know the Merkle root and basically goes from the old L2 state root to the new L2 state root given a set of transactions. Uh, and that, that computation is being verified through uh, the validity proof here. Um, so I, I, with limited time, I'm gonna kind of keep going on here. Um, and lastly, we have the unilateral withdrawal transaction. Uh, and that transaction structure looks like something like this. So uh, keep in mind in the L2 state update transaction, we did have a bunch of withdrawals. Those are withdrawals where the user is going to the sequencer on L2 and saying, hey, I want to withdraw my funds, you know, include this in your next state update. You know, we expect that to be the, the maybe the more common way of withdrawals, but an important part of validity you know, roll-up construction is that uh, even if the sequencer is maybe censoring or disagreeing, a user should always be able to unilaterally withdraw their funds out of L2 back to L1. Um, and so we need to present a path here uh, which they can do that. Um, and so this would be a user-initiated transaction uh, if they want to unilaterally withdraw the, uh, you know, uh, the funds they have. Uh, and so this is where uh, you know, user would need to generate a withdrawal proof. Uh, and this is where kind of having that data availability be available as part of that witness uh, is, is really important. Um, so the user is able to, just looking at Bitcoin blockchain data, uh, generate a proof that shows that they have this particular amount you know, in the L2 in accordance with the latest L2 state root of the rollup UTXO. Uh, and you know, the, the user presents a signature as well uh, with, with the public key that's associated with that, you know, L2 account. Um, remember that was something passed in during the deposit stage. Um, and, you know, basically what's the requested withdrawal amount, 
uh, and where do they want this withdrawn to. Um, and so this, this unilateral withdrawal script, uh, you know, a bunch of verification checks are done as stated here, uh, but kind of what I want to point out here is um, remembering our L2 state root, or sorry, the, the roll-up state in the, in the roll-up ETXO. So the unilateral withdrawal um, doesn't update any of the pending deposit data, but it does update that L2 state root um, because you know now uh, you know one of the accounts uh, data changed, uh, and so we can actually update that L2 state root because we have the withdrawal proof that's been given. So we now know the updated you know Merkle leaf, uh, and we have the withdrawal proof uh, of uh, you know that amount in that leaf. So we update that amount, use that proof, and then uh, you know to update the L2 uh, state root within the role of ETXO, and uh, and then kind of enforce the covenant here again. So those are the kind of core you know script paths that we have. Um, kind of putting putting some of this all together, um, the way we expect this role of ETXO to get spent is that you you know have a bunch of deposits that users make um, on the role of ETXO. They fund kind of you know money in uh, these get uh, accumulated in the pending deposit data, and uh, on the L two, the L two is kind of looking at the mempool and and, and uh, you know once every uh, you know ten minutes takes the latest roll up ETXO um, and uh, generates a state update transaction where uh, all those deposits pending deposits are included. Uh, and you know the state update transaction updates the L2 state root, resets the pending deposits, uh, and in the meantime you can have unilateral withdrawals as well uh, that are happening. So this is kind of the the chain view uh, of what that construction looks like. Um, I'll pause here uh, for questions. I know this is a quick just, question. yeah we're, we're, yeah we're, we're, we're out of time. Hey, really fast. So lunch is going to be outside. There's going to be picnic planks and stuff. So when you go outside, you can go out there. Well, we've got about an hour of lunch. Feel free to stay here and like ask questions. It's been really great. So, I'll talk to you guys. <laughs> but if you're not on a hackathon team, like you definitely need to go out there because we're gonna be making hackathon teams very much. Right. So, okay. Thanks, guys. Very cool. Thank you very much. Um, so for your start off proposal, um, when you're hashing the program into it, what uh, represent? Like, how are you representing the program as you're creating that hash? Uh, so in in this right, uh, the program hash. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, the, the, there there are different options here. Um, you know, we you, you haven't decided yet. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So in, in this in this particular case, we're looking at something that looks like more of a mited. Closest thing would be maybe a mited VM type of construction where you have a stack based VM. Um, but you know, different zk VM constructions use this in a different way. Um, so yeah, haven't committed to exactly that. Cool. Thanks. Yet. Yeah, I have a sort of stark related question there too. Um, I don't know if there's anything better, but it does seem that like in this case, you're not hiding anything, right? And then isn't a big part of all these like zero knowledge proof systems like okay, we're hiding the program being run or we're hiding the input or something like that. So is there any research or anything where it's like, hey, we're not actually hiding anything. We don't. There's no zero knowledge aspect of here. Can we get some kind of proof where it's totally fine if, if all the inputs and all the program being run? Are public and that helps in some way make it smaller or something like that. Is there anything like that? Or? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So I mean, we're not explicitly hiding anything. We're not presenting um, signatures here as part of the input state. You know, just because it, it's just more data to put on. But you're okay. You know, yeah, if you okay. leak any portion of that, it's totally fine. Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, so much of the Stark Snark, all that stuff is like, okay, we need to hide it. You don't, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I, like, if we're looking at zk Starks, there is, you know, kind of that. Uh, I don't think Starks or Snarks natively need to be zero knowledge here. Um, so I mean, to answer your question, I don't. I don't. It's a, it's a good question. It's like, how, like, we don't actually need the. It feels like oh, yeah. So we should be able to get some assumption. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as far as I know, I don't think there's any, you know, kind of way to make that trade off. So yeah. To speak. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any last question? Thanks.